what is entity resolution and how it can be applied in practice. Top tips from a serial entrepreneur, including how to deal with VCs. What is Berlin startup scene like and how a PhD in genetics became a tech entrepreneur? Following is my conversation with Steven Rennick, a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Tilores. Enjoy. Steven, can you describe us the concept of entity resolution or what entity resolution is? Sure. So entity resolution describes the process of deduplicating and linking record data. So that record data can be anything. It can be customer um, records. It can be products. It can be companies. But the idea is that you have a large volume of this data from one or multiple sources and the data is messy, it's inconsistent, and you want to somehow um, remove the duplicates and link it together. So in practice, the way of doing that is using um, so-called fuzzy data matching to match the records based on their attributes, such as name, um, matching them based on using fuzzy matching, and then making the data searchable later. So you can actually use complete data records rather than individual data records. Uh, how it is applied in practice, for instance, uh, which 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 industries mostly e-commerce? Yeah, well, I mean, entity resolution is used in pretty much um, every industry where you have large volumes of record data. So I, I could give you like two examples. Um, so in healthcare, for example, um, if you've got information about if you've got patient records from multiple different clinics and say you're an insurance company or do you want to be able to match all that data together to one um, patient so you know all the medical history of one person either for billing reasons um, or for you know knowing the person's complete medical history when you're in the hospital um, then you would probably have to do entity resolution on the data where you don't have to do that is if you have some kind of unique key like an insurance number um, to you can use to match the data together, but that's not always the case, particularly uh, in the US. Um, another example would be fraud detection. So if you're running an e-commerce um, website, you have customers signing up to your platform every day. They're signing up with their name, uh, their address, uh, maybe their email address, maybe a phone number. If you have, if you're attacked by fraudsters, um, it's very likely that they will create multiple accounts and just change some of the details each time. So it looks like a completely fresh account, but there's some kind of relationship between them. And if you use fuzzy matching, you can make uh, the links between these customer accounts and realize that, okay, all these accounts are actually related together. This is probably one fraud attack and you can use that to block um, returning fraudsters. Are entity resolution tools on the, uh, for, available for, for big companies? Um, I mean, it's mostly used by big, data com uh, big companies because it's the sort of problem that only really affects um, companies once they get a bit larger. Um, it's the sort of pro uh, problem that people almost ignore when they're smaller. There's other things you should be concentrating on at first. And once you get a bit larger and you start realizing that this messy, bad data is causing you financial problems, then you try and solve it. So traditionally, yes, the entity resolution tools have only been used by larger companies. Um, our tool, we make it, um, we have a freemium business model so that anyone can actually sign up and use our software uh, for free without even speaking it to us. So smaller companies can uh, use it as well. All uh, right. So let, let's talk about your latest project, TLRS. Yeah, which uh, seems to fill the gap uh, for, yep. for the identity resolution tool for, for everyone. Yeah, exactly. So Tilo Res is a highly scalable real-time um, entity resolution tool. So it can be used for any use case um, when you need to do record matching. Most of the time we're working on fraud detection, KYC or anti-money laundering type data. And we provide the software in two different versions. We've got a private SaaS version, which means it is installed into your AWS infrastructure and um, you actually run it. We also have public SaaS, which means you can come along to our website, sign up um, online, 
manage the whole thing in the user interface and we run we actually host it for you so yeah small companies can use the public SaaS version very easily um it's pretty simple to get started it's got a no code um interface so anybody can basically build these deduplication and linking rules and get started with making their um, data better um could you just more and, and tell us more about the story of TLRS because this is quite interesting as a, as a spin off from a credit bureau. Sure. So, yeah, exactly. We are, I was the chief product officer in a German consumer credit bureau called uh, Regus24. And as you can imagine, credit bureaus have large volumes of data uh, about people that comes from lots of different sources. That data is very messy, it's inconsistent, there's no unique keys in the data. But you need to match the data together to say, this is all the data about this one person. And you have to do it in a very um, strict, careful way. You have to be very careful with data compliance. And yeah, inside this credit bureau, we wanted to build it. Well, we wanted, we wanted to buy a technology, actually, to do this um, for us. But we couldn't find any technology in the market that give us the performance we were looking for. That was being scalable, being real time, being fast. Um, we tried usual technologies like graph databases, like Elasticsearch. None of them worked very well. So in the end, we built our own technology from scratch. That became the core data infrastructure for the credit bureau. And it worked so well, we thought, well, why not spin this out into a new company and see if we can sell it directly? And we did that at the end of 2021. And yeah, it, it worked. We raised a small investment round for it. And um, four of us from the credit bureau left to become the founding team of the startup who are your clients um clients so far are mostly in the e-commerce and kind of finance space so um our kind of one of our our biggest clients is a large um electronics e-commerce company using us for fraud prevention there's also a baffin regulated uh, fintech company in there um, and a few other companies doing fraud prevention on their data. We've also got a very large company doing um, company data matching and a few others that are working on product data management. So just now it's very varied, um, but we're starting to concentrate a little bit more on this kind of fintech e-commerce fraud prevention space. Uh, so the market bought the idea. The market bought the Well, yeah, it's... Um, so far, yeah, I mean, it was still early stage um, or early days for us. The market definitely buys the idea because every single company knows this problem of uh, bad data. The challenge is helping them realize the difference that actually makes financially because it's no point in just fixing data problems for the sake of fixing data problems. You have to show that this actually has a financial impact. When it comes to fraud prevention, it's relatively straightforward to take a data sample and say, okay, if Tilores had been running um, in the past, then we would have caught these fraud cases and you would have saved um, this much money, for example. Nevertheless, it's still, I'm not going to pretend it's an easy software to sell. You know, it's a critical infrastructure for companies. Nobody buys this sort of thing on a whim. Therefore, our sales cycles are relatively long. But um we get very involved. You know, we do proof of concepts with our customers. We do a lot of consulting to them to help them best set up the software. And then once it's up and running, the good thing with Tilo Res is it basically just runs. Um, there's no uh, maintenance required. There's no DevOps teams required because it runs on serverless technology. It's high. It's basically no maintenance costs required whatsoever. Right. You're a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I how many startups you have been involved so far into? Yeah, I mean, a serial entrepreneur is maybe a generous term uh, that would suggest I'd had success in the past. I mean, this is this is my second serious startup. Um, you know, I've dabbled with a few other things before, but this is my second real startup. My previous startup was a um, fintech company in the UK called Satago, which I founded in uh, about 2012. Well, actually, um, I ran it until 2017. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have a successful exit. Um, the company is still going today, but I made no money from it. It was eventually bought 
by a private equity fund and they invested a lot more money into it, listed it on the stock market in the UK, and it's now part owned by uh, the UK's biggest um, business bank. So it's doing very well. Um, just sadly, I got no, none of the benefit from it. Right, that's still still a big product uh, success in a way. If yeah, the, I mean, the product was, was um, very, very good. I mean, just to, to tell you briefly what it is, or um, it's a credit control tool which integrates into small businesses accounting software so it takes over the process of chasing their business customers for payment it also gives you risk uh, integrated risk um, insights as, uh, into the credit worthiness of your customers but the last bit which makes it very special is that um, it does invoice financing so for each individual invoice um, which is in the system they can do a, a kind of a, a, a credit um, check on whether or not they want to buy this invoice and they offer you finance. So basically offer you 85% of the value of an invoice um, immediately as, uh, as soon as you've sent it to a customer rather than waiting 30 or 60 days to get paid. So it's basically a way of improving cash flow. So it's like a, a like factoring tool. Yeah, it's basically, oh, that's exactly what it is. It's a factoring tool. It's just traditionally factoring was done on whole sales ledgers and it was traditionally done for much bigger companies what we did was use technology to make it uh, easy to offer factoring on individual invoices and also on very small invoices so you had the the choice of what to finance when to finance it so you were um, completely in control and we could finance invoices as small as 500 um, pounds um, and finance hundreds of them at a time it was a it's a very good technology uh, before we come to your path, which is very interesting from, from a PhD in genetics to, to entrepreneur, uh, what would be your tips that you would like to share on how to find good ideas for a startup, for a business? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the best tip is always to scratch your own itch. Um, it's very difficult to just sit there in a vacuum and come up with an idea um it very rarely happens um that you can come up with a really good idea just by kind of sitting there the best ideas come from personal experience or um, or something yeah something you've encountered so satago for example was based on my experience of growing up with a small family business um in the construction sector where late payment is always a problem so i wanted to always try and solve something about that and um, the current business Tilo Res, is really obviously it's based on having actually worked in the credit bureau so working with the technology there um, but once you're working in those sorts of companies any sort of company you'll start to see things which you think are inefficient and you think oh you know what if there was a product to do this or that that for me is the best way to come up with ideas at least um at least business to business ideas which is the, the only area i've really been active in uh do you believe that now, uh, I this morning I've come across a, an interesting, uh, interesting uh, concept of zebra. So far, we had unicorns, <laughs> and everybody wanted to become a unicorn as a startup, which means to reach a one billion dollars valuation. Yeah. Now, uh, startups uh, are. Uh, aiming to become zebras. What does zebra mean in this context? Uh, I've got no idea. Are you, are you going to tell me? Uh, no. <laughs> Have a guess, please. A zebra. Uh, is it something like a hidden profitable company? Um, kind of. It's uh, it's a company to fo that focuses on on stable growth, uh -huh. uh, making revenue. Uh, trying to fund itself organically as fast as possible. Yeah, that seems that's the way businesses used to be done. For centuries. Yeah, exactly. I mean, venture capital as a kind of concept is only really like 40 or 50 years old, I think, you know. Um, businesses used to just grow naturally based on getting customers and selling stuff. I mean, I, I think venture capital has its place. It's good to get businesses started, but these these companies that just keep raising round after round after round 
without ever reaching any sort of profit, decent profitability or or decent revenue level, I think that's that's hopefully going to die down a little bit. I mean, obviously, a lot of the overfunding problems were caused by just too much cash out there, low interest rates. Where should this money go? Venture capital firms have just given all this money to invest somewhere, and nobody really cares that much about how much revenue you're making. So you end up with these companies with these ridiculous valuations, but actually they're only making a few million um, ARR or annual recurring revenue. They're not actually anywhere near justifying the valuations they've got. I think at the minute, I would be a little bit embarrassed to be described as unicorn. I mean, good problem to have, but the term has become a little bit toxic in a way because it almost implies that you are a fantasy um, animal. You know, you're you're you have this fantasy valuation that is not in touch with reality so yeah maybe if we ever get to the um stage of having a billion dollar valuation i will try to propose some alternative term which is less based in fantasy uh, would you agree that in the current business climate it is easier to be a b2b startup than a b2c startup well, I don't know if it's easier. Um, I mean, I always get the feeling that B2C is kind of... More likely um, to become Zebra. More likely to become Zebra. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Because B2C, you need to invest, you need to go big. You make small money on large volumes of people. And therefore, you need to go big at some point. Unless you're selling like a product that people want to buy individually, you know, like physical goods. Um then hopefully you make profit per per item. But even then, many people get start have to get started using stuff on the Kickstarter to set, effectively pre-sell. Um, but yeah, in theory, if you've got a good product, then you should be able to at least get some customers with your first MVP in the business business sector and build from there. Whether you can really do that without any funding is you know always a bit questionable. I'm a big fan of bootstrapped businesses. I admire greatly people that manage to get businesses up and off the ground with absolutely no funding, but that typically requires a lot of sacrifice. You know, these are not, they, they are very often either people that are quite a lot younger, so they can live on almost no money. You know, they're sharing a house, they're eating cheap foods, they're not going out very often, and they just focus on their business. Or there are people that have made a lot of money elsewhere. You know, they're on their second or third business. They don't want to raise investment or they've been done very well in banking or consulting so they can afford to live without much revenue at the start. Um, but yeah, I have great admiration for people that can they can get bootstrap businesses up and running and off the ground. I know very few in the technical uh, domain, to be honest. But... I know of a, I know of a couple, um, and I, I I know of two or three um, that I think are quite impressive, and um, and then you read about more of them online. But there's always something, yeah. There's always something a little bit special about a bootstrap business which is growing well, especially when they've got VC backed competition. But I think that let's say you you're of course a, a a true serial entrepreneur to me. But I have a joke. I coined a joke myself that the time of serial entrepreneurs is coming to an end with uh, yeah. SBB bankruptcy and and uh, higher interest rates and so on and inflation because serial entrepreneurs before were the ones that were getting series after series of funding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the uh, definition. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's for different businesses, then you have to question, you know, how... Uh, have those businesses been successful? Is there a good reason to keep funding? I mean, obviously you learn from mistakes, right? So um, that's what I did with Satago. I tried to put the learnings from those mistakes into the strategy for the next business. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope I will at some point be described as a successful entrepreneur rather than just a real entrepreneur. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, what? Coming to, to VCs, um, what would be your tips how to deal with VCs? Because um, most of the people that are into, into startups, into tech businesses, use VC money, mm -hmm. like it or not. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, how to, how to use them. I mean, only take money from people you like. Um, this comes down to, a little bit to the, the privilege of choice. You know, if you, the reality is that most businesses go out there and have to pitch to a hundred or more VC firms and you get rejections from almost all of them. If you're lucky, one, or if you're very lucky, two, of them will make you an offer to invest. Um, we had three investment offers when we did our round. And you're going to spend a lot of time with these people for the next three to 10 years, probably. Um, therefore, you have to like them. So only take money from people whose values align with you on a kind of personal level. It's more important the individuals that you deal with rather than the firm overall. Um, I mean, arguably, when we did our investment round, we declined a kind of prestigious Silicon Valley um, firm and went with a less well-known European firm. Uh, but that was because we liked the people. We felt like we could work very well with them. So be very careful about that. But that means it's a ton of work to raise investment. And if you've got no network whatsoever, it's going to be very, very difficult for you. So if you want to raise VC money, that you think it's on the horizon, you need to be nurturing these relationships. You need to be getting to know people, tell them about what you're doing before you need the money so that they want to keep in touch with you to find out for when you are ready to raise the investment. And there's this old saying that, um, you know, if you ask people for money, they'll give you advice. But if you ask them for advice, they'll give you money. So, you know, keep that in mind um, and maybe be asking for the advice from the VCs now rather than the money. Rather than the money. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I've heard it somewhere, but doesn't probably matter. not just me. I'm sure I'm sure a few other people say the same thing. Yeah, but it's it's a it doesn't come out very often to be honest. Mm. This yeah. thing. Um. Any advice as to the pitch? How to how how to how to make a, a pitch so that people would talk to you? So how to maybe increase <laughs> one or two into three or five? Yeah, I mean, the thing with the, the pitching is, is it's become such an almost industry on its own that there's no shortage of advice out there. I think you're better off going to Sequoia's website and looking at their how to make a pitch deck thing. You know, they've, they've always got pretty much the same structure. I think, yeah, so in terms of structure, there's nothing I can really add to that. The one thing I would say is make it beautiful. Um, Theoretically, people only care about the content, right? What you have to say, not how it looks. But the reality is that beautiful design just makes people think that you have a well-run company that does things well, which look good for customers. So it has a psychological impact. So if you can get a designer for your pitch deck to make your slides look good, then, then do that. Um, there's also nowadays quite a few tools out there which can do a pretty good job of making your slides beautiful, even if you're not a designer. I, I'm not very good at making beautiful slides, I, but I started using a service recently called beautiful.ai, which makes really nice looking slides. Beautiful.ai. Um, beautiful.ai. It's difficult to make ugly it. slides using that tool. Um, I just started using it like last week or the week before, made some really nice slides that I presented last week. Looks great. Um, so yeah. My one tip would be to make the design good, even if you think you don't need to, you do. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, so let's come to your personal path. Hmm. Uh, you have PhD in genetics and your first field of studies was, was biochemistry, right? Yeah, exactly. So. It's often difficult for me to explain how uh, genetics PhDs ended up in, you know, data technology. Um, but yeah, I did the PhD in genetics. I studied the cell cycle of the humble fish and yeast. So it's at the end of the day, it's um, medical research or it's um, cancer research because that's what it's all about. That's why you, we do it. After I did the PhD, I moved. I did that in London. I moved to Oxford to join a small consulting company where I worked on valuation of intellectual property and deal licensing. So working with biotechs and pharma companies to help them do deals with each other. 
And the consulting company also sold a database of business information to pharma companies. So they would pay quite large fees to get access to this database. And I basically became the product manager for this um, database. And I thought it had a lot of potential. I thought it could do with um, being redeveloped. So persuaded the, the CEO to let us redevelop this database, which we did. Relaunched it and it was quite successful. I thought, hey, this, this database stuff is more interesting than the pharma stuff. I'll try and do this. So I went to um, uh, business school and university at the University of Oxford, did my MBA, and then came out of that and joined Rocket Internet, which is the German e commerce incubator. Launched one business for them in London. A prestigious one. Uh, well, prestigious or depends, <laughs> depends on your point of view. <laughs> I mean, place in this area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they almost created the Berlin um, ecosystem for startups, but they also had a very bad reputation for just copying businesses from America. I think it was a great experience. I mean, I that's where I got my first serious startup internet business experience. Um, they moved me to Berlin to the HQ. I worked here for yeah. I worked for Rocket Internet only for about two years in the total. Great two years. Um, you know, it's, it's back when companies like HelloFresh were just getting started. Now they're worth billions and they're actually genuinely worth billions. Um, but yeah, that was what took me to internet businesses. And I was at Rocket Internet. And then I started that business, uh, Satago, back in the UK. And I was actually doing commuting between Berlin and London, doing the remote work and commuting before it was um, made popular by the COVID lockdowns. What's so beautiful about data, <laughs> data businesses? What's so beautiful about data? Ah, that's a good question. I moved you from, 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 from your previous, I, think I, I guess, passion. Yeah, what, I mean, what's beautiful about data is that if you bring order to it, you can genuinely do amazing things. Um, I mean, Satago, was actually a big data business as well. The original idea was we'll use these accounting software integrations to crowdsource data about when the business customers pay them and then use that to make crowdsourced business data reports. The idea kind of works, but it didn't become the focus. Um, but it just showed that if you kind of bring order to this otherwise chaotic data, you can do something great with it. It's the same with entity resolution. All these companies have got tons of data and it causes massive inefficiencies. It causes them to lose out on sales. It results in people managing to commit fraud. If you can bring order to that chaos, then you can do beautiful things with it. So, yeah, the, the beauty of data is, um, in my opinion, bringing order to chaos. And the beauty of Berlin. <laughs> the startup <laughs> hub and it's and, and yeah. super lovely. I mean, I've been in Berlin for 11 years now. Um, when I first came here, one of the beauties of it was how affordable it is or was, and it's certainly not as affordable now. It's a great city to be in. There's a fantastic buzz. It's very international, um, lots of startups, but it has got a little bit too popular now and has a struggle with, for example, people finding accommodation. It's almost impossible to find uh, apartments if you move to Berlin these days. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's... The supply is incredibly low um, and the demand is very high. So people have a nightmare finding flats and the price of flats that people are charging here nowadays is crazy. I'm, in, I'm lucky I'm in a, a flat with an 11 year old contract. And fortunately, the, at least my contract is relatively um, stable as in the price can't go up so much. You know, the, the laws on rent increases are very different between different countries, but in Germany, you can raise it by a maximum of something like 15% every three years, and it depends on the average price in the area. If you live in London, then from one year to the next, the landlord could decide to double your rent if he wants, and that's just tough luck, you're out. Same in Warsaw, but I thought that you know, in Berlin, there are still some empty spaces in this post-communist blocks in the eastern part of the city where you can... Well, I mean, there are open spaces and there are blocks that could probably be developed but everyone wants to live in the center within the ring band so everyone wants to live in Mitte, Prenzlauer Berg or Kreuzberg basically right 
It's, I, I, the thing is, it used to be easy to live there. You know, you could, you could. Um, plenty of people were living, paying like a couple of hundred euros rent a month if they were living in a shared flat, and you know, having a very nice life based on that. But nowadays, you know, the rents are not close to London. But they're, I think the rent in Berlin is the fastest growing rental market in Europe now. Apart from, from rent problems and accommodation, um, is it worth coming to Berlin if you are a startup person? And how would you encourage or discourage uh, somebody? Yeah, yeah I'd, say, I'd, I'd say it's definitely worth coming here. The, I mean, there's tons of people here, right? I mean... Of course, well, many people nowadays are running remote first businesses, but that's not always the case. You very often want to be near near to the people you're working with, and there is a concentration of people here. Berlin continues to attract people from across the world. Um, there's no question about that. Um, commercial property is a lot cheaper than many other countries. I'm sure if you tried to um, rent an office in London or Paris or something, it would cost you significantly more than it costs in Berlin. And it's just a fun place to be. There's always something going on. Um, I mean, we, we run a data science event once a month and we'll have like, you know, 50 data scientists turn up just to talk about the business of data science. Those things are going on in a place like Berlin. If you were living in a much smaller place, then maybe it wouldn't be quite so um, exciting. Right. And um, are there any, let's say, specific things uh, related to Berlin which are different from from for instance, startup community in London or other big cities in Europe, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I, I can only speak for London and Berlin because those are the two places I've lived. Um, I guess one of the big differences nowadays is Brexit. You know, it's um, anybody can easily live in, in Germany if they're from the European Union, whereas the UK, that door is shut now. So your chances of, I guess, serendipitously meeting people in London is reduced. Um, I hear from people hiring that it's much more difficult to get people from Europe to the UK now. So London definitely suffers. Um, one of the flip side is there's way, 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 way more money in London. You know, the number of venture capital firms in London is multiple of what there is in Berlin, although Berlin has significantly increased its, um, its venture capital ecosystem. But still, in London, there's just tons more rich people. So if you're looking for business angels, or private family offices, or you know, maybe more specialized private equity firms. There's just an order of magnitude more wealthy people that are able to make um, personal investments into a company if you're looking for business angels rather than venture capital at the start. Yeah, this is always smart money, not necessarily. Is it? Sorry? Smart money. Uh, yeah, not that's necessarily. Quite, not necessarily, no. I mean... Especially with investment bankers, you can definitely question how smart the money is. <laughs> right. My last question, your, your, your one advice to somebody who is uh, starting her or his startup journey right now. My, um, April, April 2020. April, yeah. Okay, so don't underestimate how difficult it's going to be to sell your product. Um, you can have the best product in the world but reality is that most people don't care. You have to really stand on the rooftops and shout the loudest to get anybody to care about your product, even if you think it's the most amazing thing in the world. There's very few cases where a good product just sells itself. It almost always comes down to marketing and distribution. So don't underestimate how difficult that is. Don't underestimate how much effort you have to put in, um, including cold calling and you know, basically doing the things that make you uncomfortable. It will never be easy, but if you do have a good product, then it should be worth it because you will get that traction and you will be rewarded. Yeah, makes sense. Also from my experience. I'm glad to hear it. Stephen, thank you so much for uh, having this conversation with me. And uh, I think that there are many takeaways for our audience. Uh, rarely do I... Uh, meet people with this combination of great knowledge and down-to-earth approach in a, in a good way. So uh, a pleasure to, to have had you here. My pleasure. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening to Sherpa Search on Tech. If you have enjoyed the show, please subscribe to our show wherever you listen. Thanks again. The Sherpa Search on Tech podcast is a production of Sherpa Search, an executive search firm specializing in the tech industry, helping hire the right people for expert and managerial positions, and advising how to build and develop long-lasting, high-performing IT teams. If you would like to learn more, reach out to us at maciej.szczerba at sherpasearch.tech or visit our website sherpasearch.tech. See you next time. Thank you.